and I'm clumsy. Okay, so blood volume. Um, you have about 7% of your body weight in kilograms. Uh, we'll tell you how many liters of blood you have. If you guys are not aware, there are 2.2 pounds per kilogram. Okay, so you'll be fewer kilograms than you are pounds. Um, somebody who is 110 pounds, so 110 divided by 2.2 is 50. Just a nice easy number to use. Um, so if someone's 110 pounds, they would be 50 kilograms. So how would you tell me how much, how much blood they have in their body? You don't have to do the math, just tell me what you would do. 50 times 0.07. 50 times 0.07, right? You want to get 7% of the number of kilograms they are. So times 0.07. Um, 7 times 7 is 35, so 3.5. 3.5 liters of blood. Okay, so a 110 pound person, which is a pretty small person, would have about 3.5 liters of blood. Um, here you see the average adult male has between five and six liters of blood. The average adult female has between four and five. Um, why do males have more? They're bigger. All right, like the average male weighs more than the average female. Bigger body, more blood volume. Um, later we'll talk about like the percentage of red blood cells and stuff, that's different. But just overall blood volume, men are bigger, men tend to have more blood. Um, when we talk about blood, there's some general characteristics you guys should be aware of. The average temperature of blood is just over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, what's the average temperature of the body? Right, so that's a little lower, right? So notice the blood itself is a little bit warmer than the overall body temperature, and that's just because that heat dissipates, right? You've got layers of tissue. You've got adipose tissue and epithelial tissue, and you've got these kind of insulators, these layers. So when you take a body temperature, you're not taking the direct temperature of the blood. That heat's dissipating a little bit. So the body temp will be a little bit lower than the blood temp. Blood has a relatively high viscosity. Um, what's viscosity? Thickness. Thickness. The technical definition is resistance to flow. Um, so like honey does not flow very well, right? That's really viscous. It's thick, it's gooey, it's sticky. Water is like the standard that we use. Okay, water is our standard. So blood is about five times more viscous than water. Um, the reason for that is it's got stuff in it. It's not just plain water. It's got cells, about half of it is cells. It has a lot of proteins in it. It's got stuff dissolved in it and that thickens it up. Those molecules and cells interact with each other and that makes it a little bit more thick um, or a little bit more viscous than water would be. And blood is slightly alkaline. Um, what's the pH scale go from? Well, that's the pH of the blood, but with the pH scale in general? Oh, zero. zero to 14. What's a neutral pH? Seven. seven. What's acidic? Less than seven. What's alkaline or basic? Above seven. So the blood is slightly alkaline, right? It's a little bit basic. It's a little bit higher of a pH than seven. Your blood should be between 7.35 and 7.45. If it's not, then something is wrong. Um, and we can have something called alkalosis. I think you guys who had me last semester should know this. Or acidosis. So um, alkalosis is when you have a blood pH greater than 7.45. Right? It's more alkaline than it should be. Your blood is too basic. It's more basic than it should be. Acidosis is when you have a blood pH less than 7.35. Hey, your pH is too low, it's too acidic, um, more acidic than it should be. We'll talk about these conditions more as we go. Um, we can have respiratory acidosis or alkalosis that's be, um, because of a change in breathing. Your breathing actually directly affects the pH of your blood. Um, or we can have what's called metabolic. Um, and that's, that can be for numerous other reasons, but we'll talk about it when we go through renal. Um, we'll talk about it during digestive. It can be because of vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration. There's a lot of different reasons, okay? But respiration is extremely important when we talk about pH. All right, so whole blood is the blood like it is in your body. Okay, so the blood that's flowing through your vessels right now is whole blood, it's naturally existing blood. All of its components all mixed together, that's whole blood. 
when we talk about whole blood, we kind of categorize it or, or break it up into plasma and then formed elements. Um, and your blood is about half and half. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna make you memorize like the exact percentages, but it's approximately half plasma, half formed elements. In reality, it should be a little bit more plasma. There should be a little bit more plasma than there is formed elements, um, but it's approximately half and half. Plasma is the fluid. Okay, that's the fluid component, that flowing component of blood, and it's mostly water. Okay, it's gonna be over 90% water. Um, and then we've got stuff in the water. We have plasma proteins. Um, we'll talk about those more in a second, but plasma proteins are super important in the cardiovascular system. Um, and they're involved in other systems as well. These can be transport proteins that carry things through the bloodstream. They can be um, immunoglobulins, which are part of the immune system. We have um, some, trans or some plasma proteins that are involved in blood clotting. There's lots of different proteins. Okay, but the point here is there are plasma proteins. So they're proteins that are in the plasma. We have proteins that are in the bloodstream. Um, and then we have other solutes. Okay, so other stuff that's dissolved in the plasma or in the fluid. So ions, right? Sodium, potassium, chloride, um, bicarbonate, um, hydrogen ions. We have our respiratory gases, right? Like oxygen, CO2. We've got nutrients like glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, just stuff, right? Lots of stuff that's flowing through the blood. So the fluid and all the stuff that's dissolved in it is the plasma. The other just less than half of your blood is what we call formed elements. And these are cells and cell fragments. Frequently, you'll just see these called cells, um, but technically some of the things aren't exactly cells. So the formed elements include your red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Red blood cells and white blood cells are cells. But platelets are technically cell fragments. Um, we'll talk about this a lot later, but when a platelet is formed, you have this huge cell, and it pinches off little pieces of itself to form the platelets. So they're not really cells. They're just little kind of packets um, that have like clotting proteins in them. But any of these things, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, the more like solid formed things are included in the formed elements of the blood. This is just kind of showing you this breakdown. Um, again, I will not ask you to quote me the exact percentages on this, because it's gonna be different in everyone anyways. I'm always changing. Um, but these two things together, the plasma plus the formed elements, give you whole blood. Okay, whole blood is what th flows through your vessels, okay, which is going around your body all the time, is whole blood. We can separate it, which we'll talk about in a second, into its two different components plasma and the formed elements. The plasma, again, we said is mostly water, over 90% water. Then we've got a bunch of proteins, and then we've got some other solutes dissolved in it, like nutrients and vitamins and ions. Formed elements, again, we said are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Check those out. Okay, so formed elements are 99.9% .9 red blood cells. Okay, so almost every formed element, almost every cell that you see in the blood is gonna be a red blood cell. Way more red blood cells than anything. Okay. Um, we'll kind of mention these really quick right now, and then we'll spend like a lecture and a half, maybe two lectures going through them in detail, but we'll just mention them real quick before we go through the plasma in detail. So the three types of formed elements we said were red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And when we look at red blood cells, you guys should know the technical term for this is erythrocyte. The word erythros actually means red. Right? And the site refers to a cell. So erythrocyte is literally telling you red cell. Um, so erythrocytes are our red blood cells. Again, we said that these are the most abundant cells in the blood. Okay? Almost every cell that you see in the blood, when you're looking at a, a blood smear um, on, the, on the microscope, almost everything you see is gonna be a red blood cell. Again, 99.9% .9 of the cells that you see are gonna be red blood cells. Erythrocytes or red blood cells are responsible for transporting the respiratory gases. 
Okay, so they transport oxygen and CO2 through the bloodstream. So when you want to deliver oxygen to a cell, it's a red blood cell that picks it up and carries it through the bloodstream. When you want to take away carbon dioxide, it's a red blood cell that carries that carbon dioxide to take it away from the cell. Okay, so that's the job of these erythrocytes, to carry the respiratory gases through the blood. White blood cells are called leukocytes. Um, this leuco, or leuk, means white. Okay, so again, leukocyte literally means white cell. Um, and we call these white blood cells because they're not red. Okay, they're, they're, they're clear unless you stain them. Whereas when you look at red blood cells, they're red. Like, they're literally red. They're full of a red pigment, so they appear red. Um, whereas white blood cells are not. White blood cells are part of our immune system. Um, we'll talk about them again, like the whole next lecture really will focus on them a lot. But we've got five different types of white blood cells. Um, and those white blood cells are responsible for really defending your body against infection, bacteria, even your own cells that might turn into cancerous cells. Your immune system really defends the body. It helps to prevent infection and disease. And then finally, we said the last form element was a platelet. I don't know why I didn't write this, but that's a thrombocyte. Um, and the reason for that is it involves um, the activation of something called thrombin. Uh, well, again, we'll talk about that a lot when we talk about clotting. But platelets or thrombocytes are those little cell fragments. Again, they're like little envelopes that pinch off of a bigger cell, and they're involved in blood clotting. So they'll include um, a lot of clotting proteins and enzymes that get activated in order to start the whole clotting cascade. Hemopoiesis is a term um, that refers to the production of the formed elements. So hemopoiesis is producing the formed elements, producing red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Um, when we talk about hemopoiesis, it begins with stem cells that are present in the red bone marrow. Um, we utilize two different types of stem cells, myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. Lymphoid stem cells, we'll see, are going to give us lymphocytes, which are type of white blood cell. Myeloid stem cells are going to give us everything else. Okay, so they're going to give us red blood cells, platelets, and all other white blood cells. Okay, we'll talk about this process a lot. We're going to go over it multiple times. Um, but essentially, again, the point here is hemopoiesis is making these formed elements for our blood. Um, it occurs in the red bone marrow and it begins with two different types of stem cells, lymphoid stem cells and myeloid stem cells. Now, where is the red bone marrow in adults? Spongy, or, yeah, Excellent, yes, in spongy bone. So between the trabeculae and spongy bone. Remember the trabeculae are those rods of bone in spongy bone and then all those open spaces have red bone marrow. Okay, so that's excellent. That's where hemopoiesis is, is occurring, starting. Um, we'll see that some white blood cells will actually travel to other areas to mature, but it all starts in the marrow. Fractionation is the process of separating whole blood into its components. Hey, remember, whole blood is the blood as it flows through your body, and we said it contains plasma and formed elements. Fractionation is how we separate it um, so that we can analyze it and see, okay, how much is plasma? How much is formed elements? Um, we do that by centrifuging, which, you know, it's just like spinning, right? You put blood on a test tube and you spin it super, super, super fast. And what that does is it separates things based on their density. So you'll end up with a test tube like this that has the formed elements on the bottom and then the plasma on the top because the formed elements are more dense, so they settle out to the bottom. Um, so fractionation is how we take the whole blood and separate it in order to analyze the different pieces. Um, a hematocrit is a blood test um, that's very, very frequently used if you work in a doctor's office or a hospital. I'm sure you've heard of somebody getting their hematocrit. Um, or we also call it a PCV, which is packed cell volume. What this is telling us is the percentage of your whole blood 
that comes from the formed elements. Okay, so I have this blood that I take from the person. Um, I centrifuge it, right? I spin it, I separate it, and I say, okay, 46% of their blood was, you know, went down to the bottom, was formed elements. Now, what am I essentially telling you? Um, I'm trying to think of how I can phrase this. When I tell you that it comes from formed elements, what am I really telling you that it's coming from? Excellent, thank you. I didn't know how to ask that. Red blood cells. Remember, your formed elements are 99.9% .9 red blood cells. So really what I'm telling you with a hematocrit or a PCV is the percentage of the blood that's red blood cells. Um, if the hematocrit's high, that's not gonna tell me, like, or low, that's not gonna really tell me what's happening with my white blood cells. I gotta look at those on their own. Um, it's really telling you what's happening with the red blood cells. And we'll talk about that later, but it can tell you, like, for example, if someone's anemic, right? If they have low red blood cells, that's anemia. Um, because of low iron or low B12 or because they've been hemorrhaging or bleeding um, or polycythemias, high red blood cells. We'll talk about those as we go. What's up? Um, how can you really dictate whether it's if it's high? If it's higher than 99.9%. Oh no, so the percentage of whole blood. So you see here for males, the hematocrit averages about 46. Uh -oh. And that could be plus or minus like five. Um, but the, the, uh, for males, 46% of their blood is normally red blood cells. So if your hematocrit for a male came back at 35, that's a low hematocrit. I would be worried about bleeding. Um, so yeah, almost all of it's red blood cells, but you're looking at the percentage of the whole blood. Um, and then again, for females, it's a little bit lower than that. Um, females typically have a little bit lower hematocrit, um, and that's Due to a couple of different things, testosterone is a big, a big reason for that. Testosterone stimulates red blood cell production and women obviously have less testosterone. Um, some references will cite menses, but that's only a certain time of the month. It's not like that's gonna affect your hematocrit all the time. Um, so the, the hormonal influence is probably a lot bigger of an influence there. introduction to the formed elements. Again, we'll go through them individually in a ton of detail, um, really the second and third part of the lecture. Now we'll just talk through the plasma in a little bit more detail. Plasma, again, is just the fluid part of blood, right? So the water and the stuff that's dissolved in the water. Um, <clears throat> we said that about half of your whole blood is plasma, normally a little bit more than half, but about half of your, your blood is plasma. And we said that the plasma, again, is mostly water. Um, it's less than 10% solutes, and when we look at those solutes, most of them are proteins. Um, we specifically call these plasma proteins because they're proteins that are dissolved in the plasma. Okay? They're proteins that are in the bloodstream, and they stay in the bloodstream. Um, for the most part, they will not leave the bloodstream. Now, let's just talk really quickly, um, just kind of review our fluids here. Remember, all fluids in the body are either intracellular or extracellular fluids, right? Um, which ones are inside cells? Intracellular fluids are inside cells. That means all of the fluid outside of cells is extracellular, right? Extra, like outside, exit. So everything outside is extracellular fluid. Extracellular fluid includes the interstitial fluid, right, that surrounds all of our cells, that's outside of a cell, and it includes the blood, right, because that's not inside of a cell either. Is that okay? Okay, so all extracellular fluids, right, the fluids that are outside of cells include our interstitial fluid that surrounds our cells, and our plasma that's in the blood. Now, when we look at these two fluids, when we look at the two extracellular fluids, plasma and interstitial fluid, they're very, very similar in composition. And we see that the um, like um, nutrient composition or concentrations, ion concentrations, pH, all of that is very, very similar. And the reason for that is diffusion. Um, when we look at our, our capillaries, are the smallest blood vessels, um, but you see, like, if this is a blood capillary and this is the interstitial fluid, we're going to constantly have things diffusing 
right, in and out of the blood and crossing in and out of the blood in order to even out concentrations. So the concentrations between the interstitial fluid and the blood are going to be very similar. The, the composition will be very, very similar. The key difference between those two fluids is plasma proteins. Um, so the major difference between plasma and interstitial fluid is that plasma has plasma proteins. Hence, we call them plasma proteins. They're proteins in the plasma. Um, plasma proteins are big. Remember we talked about proteins. They're, what are proteins made out of? Chains of amino acids. An amino acid is a decent sized molecule, right? It's a good sized molecule, it's pretty big. Um, but when you have an amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, and I start putting hundreds of these together, right? And I fold this into this big, huge thing, that's a big molecule. They're too big to cross the capillary walls. Capillaries have little tiny holes for things to cross in and out. They don't have huge holes, um, most capillaries. So plasma proteins are essentially stuck in the blood. Um, they don't leave and go into the interstitial fluid very easily. So plasma proteins stay in the blood. That's the major difference between the plasma and the fluid outside the blood, the, the interstitial fluid. And this is actually gonna be super important. Um, when we talk about blood vessels, we talk about things crossing in and out of the blood. Um, that the fact that that fluid stays in the blood, or the, that the protein stays in the blood is really, really important. Um, let me just finish, what time is it? Is that fast? Good. Two minutes? Sweet, I got three minutes. Okay. So let's just mention plasma proteins really quickly. Uh, plasma proteins, again, are proteins that are in the plasma, right? They're proteins that stay in the bloodstream. And the majority of these are made by the liver. Um, this is kind of an important thing for you to remember in the back of your head because anytime you have a patient with liver failure or hepatitis, anything affecting the liver, you have to start thinking plasma proteins, right? My plasma proteins are gonna be messed up. They won't have enough plasma proteins because their liver is not functioning to make them. And then that's gonna affect a whole host of other things. Um, again, we mentioned that there's a higher concentration of these in the blood versus the interstitial fluid. I just said that because they're big, right? They're too big to cross the capillary wall, so they're essentially stuck in the bloodstream. This is extremely important because it maintains the osmotic pressure of blood. If you don't remember osmosis, go back and look at it a little bit. Um, we're gonna use it a lot when we talk about capillaries. But remember, osmotic pressure is essentially, what it says is if a solution has more solutes, Right? If it's got a lot of stuff dissolved in it, it's gonna pull water. So the plasma proteins are stuff, right? They're big things in the blood. So because there's a lot of things in the blood, we can pull fluid into the blood. We'll go through that in like real science, technical definition terms. Um, but that's kind of what we mean there. It just maintains that the osmotic pressure um, of the blood because they're big and they're stuff and they stay in the bloodstream. We've got lots of different plasma proteins. Um, albumins are mostly transport molecules. So what that means is they, they grab onto things and transport them through the blood. So like thyroid molecule, I mean thyroid hormone, um, some steroid hormones, iron, and things like that that don't travel well in the blood by themselves. We have a protein that grabs a hold of them, gives them solubility, and kind of carries them through the bloodstream. Globulins, some of them are transport molecules. Um, and they're also antibodies, um, which we call antibodies immunoglobulins because they're part of the immune system. Well, again, we'll talk about those a lot later. Um, fibrinogen is a common um, plasma protein and that's involved in blood clotting. Again, we'll, we'll go through the whole clotting cascade at the end of the chapter. And I'm gonna have to stop. Yeah, I'll stop there. All right, if you guys have lab tonight, I'll see you in a little bit. It'll be an easy lab night.